Another episode of Trophy Moments and a few firsts with me, Keith Baldwin. And for today, I've got a special guest, Ken Dunnick from Philly Man and Jersey Man Magazine. And I want to thank you for coming in and thank welcome you. Ken. Thank you. Let's hold, let's hold up the magazine. Right, we've got to give him a little we'll bit of the, a we'll plug. Get the full effect here. There's a copy so, of Jersey Man right there. Jersey Man, and there is also a Philly Man. Correct. Okay. We're in Philly. I should have brought the Philly Man copy. Yeah. Sorry about that. So how often, I've got so many questions for you. So tell me how you got into the publishing business. Well, that might chew up all, most of our, a lot of time here, give, but give me a, uh, I'll give you the synopsis. Um, I had a journalism degree and really never had a chance to use it. I've done some college football for TV over the years, but really never got into writing or creativity. It's always been something that I wanted to do. I had four daughters pretty early in life, so I had to make as much money as I could. So all of my journalistic aspects went out the window uh, on pause and until I got to this stage in life. And then in uh, 2008, I wrote a book called An Improbable Journey. I did not know that. Yeah, about all the famous people I've met in my life, like John Travolta and Mike Tyson and Don Rickles and all these now, people. Now, where can I find that? Can I get it's it? It's on Amazon. I think yeah. it's on Amazon, yeah. Um, I don't know how many copies are left. I didn't buy that many to, <laughs> to, to print that many. But um, So a local reporter read that book and liked it, liked the way I wrote, and actually approached me with uh, the idea of starting a men's magazine. So in 2010, we launched then Jersey Man only, Jersey Man magazine. Merrill Reese was on the cover. And then uh, a couple of years later, we uh, branched over to Philly Man magazine. And uh, 14 years later, here we are with a successful brand, not only in this area, but we have a franchise in Boston that somebody else owns and operates, our good friend Matt Roboto up there. And then Miami Man, we own and operate from here. So we got Philly, Jersey, Boston, and Miami in the- uh, It had to take a lot of guts- or ignorance. I think, it's, I think it was most <laughs> To start in 2010, yeah. a print magazine. Yeah, people when, were getting out. And people I didn't, were getting and, out, and right. I did, and I didn't know why. I quickly found out that it's uh, it's very difficult to sell straight print advertising these days. Um, even though I had a paper background, I knew friends who were printers. We did this about as economically feasibly as we could possibly do it. But still, it was a struggle until we came up with the idea of monetizing our parties. Back then, we used to throw these smaller parties. I was going to ask you to get into that. You've been, you've been yep. involved with us almost from the very beginning. And we would try to sell print advertising from these parties. Well, people would come to me the next day and say, listen, I love what you're doing. I love the network, but my company won't buy print advertising, but I want to keep coming. So we decided to launch the Legacy Club, which you're a part of, and and the Legacy Club it was really designed as a way for non-advertisers to attend these private monthly events. And it was an immediate success. We signed 100 people right off the bat at $1,000 a year. That offset some of the losses that the magazine was incurring. And, and that, uh, that has grown over the years. I believe we have over 300 Legacy Club members right now. From that spawned a Chairman's Club, which is a higher-end networking group. It's five figures. We have 16 people in that. And, of course, with our magazine advertising, and then we, we have a gala that we just had a couple of weeks ago where we raised some money for charity. So that's really uh, the package of what we do here. Well, I don't know if you know it or not, but you were part of one of my first. First time I've ever gone to the National Football Hall of Fame, mm. walked through, and saw a jersey of somebody that I knew. Listen. <laughs> Can you take me to... Am I blushing? <laughs> Can you tell to, to the jersey, yeah. your jersey, jersey, that is in the in... NFL Hall of Fame. How to get yes. there, why? Well, let me let me just clarify. <laughs> I am not in the Hall of Fame. My jersey is in the Hall of Fame, but that's close enough for me. But anyway, what happened was... Hey, I wasn't going to tell them that part of it. I was going to let them think that you're in the Hall of we, Fame. Um, I played for the Philadelphia Stars after my Eagles career uh, for three years, and the we were having a Stars reunion, I guess about four or five years ago, uh, Carl Peterson, who was the president of the Stars back then, sent me the trophy, which he had in his office. He was the president of the Chiefs, too, for years. He sends me the trophy. I keep it in my home. I take it to the uh, the reunion. I bring it back home. It's in my house for a year. Finally, I, I call Carl. I said, Carl, I got the second most famous football trophy in my house. My <laughs> wife says somebody's going to break in. What do you want me to do? He goes, I just talked to Canton. They want the trophy. This guy's going to call you, and, you know, we'll arrange to have it picked up. Guy calls me. I give him my address. I tell him, you know, where to go, and he says, do you have a game jersey? I said, yeah, why? He goes, well, we'd like it for the USFL exhibit in the Hall of Fame. I said, you don't want my jersey. You want 
Sam Mills or Kelvin Bryant or Chuck Fusina, one of these big time players. He goes, no, no, you were there for all three years. You know, we've done our research. We think, you know, guys like you made the league. I said, okay. So I threw my jersey in the box. Little do I know about a few months later, somebody's walking through there. It might have even been I, you. I, I said, think it was me. I texted said, you. Do you know your jersey's picture. in the Hall of Fame? I said, ah, what do you want me to say? <laughs> You're talking to the Hall of Fame. So, but like everything, mostly in my life, I backdoored my way into the Hall of Fame. So that's okay. So you played, you mentioned off Apparently that you right. played a little football. You played for the Eagles. Tight end? Tight end for the Eagles. Yep. Who was your quarterback and when? Jaworski. I was on the 80 uh, Super Bowl team. There's the NFC championship ring. But uh, it's a weird, very quick story. of you know I didn't play high school football. Even. So I was a basketball player. Went to Memphis State on a basketball scholarship. I was throwing the athle- uh, outside the athletic dorm, throwing the football around with a buddy, drinking beer, actually. And uh, the tight ends coach for the football team saw me. And he goes, you know, you're not going to play in the NBA. You know that, right? I said, yeah, I know. He goes, well, you, how fast are you? I said, I don't know. I've never run a 40. He has me run a 40. I run a 4640. I was 6'6", 235. And he said, you, you have to try this. So you go, That's like a first-round draft choice. So I tried it. I was pretty good and uh, caught a few touchdowns. And coming out of uh, college, I had three free agent offers, the Saints, the Rams, and the Eagles. And I chose the Eagles, one, because of Dick Vermeil. And two, because I thought it would look better to be cut from the best team. If I, <laughs> if I got cut from the Eagles, the Saints might take a shot at me. If I got cut from the Saints, my career is over before it got started. So whatever, and that was my rationale. And of course, it worked. And I made the team the year they go to the Super Bowl and played briefly for the Colts and Giants and three years for the Stars and hung it up for a good in nineteen. And the Stars, you won a championship. We won two championships. We were in the championship game all three years. We won it twice. People that are not familiar with that league, that was the birthplace for players like Reggie White, Jim Kelly, Herschel Walker, Doug Flutie, Mike Rozier, um, Steve Young, a lot of great players. And played, Ken came out of the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. if you want to put my name in there, I guess, I guess you should since I'm a That's Hall of absolutely, Famer, you're right? in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Right. Well, here's another funny thing. My jersey hangs with Jim Kelly's in the USFL exhibit. And all my friends call me and say, it's great for you, but what do you think Jim Kelly thinks about sharing, <laughs> sharing that space? Well, I said, that's his problem, not mine. <laughs> so you're here because I want to ask you a few questions about your trophy moment. Yeah. And I think I know what that is. I think you do because you're one of the few people I've shared that story with. Well, I would like to amplify that and share it with this audience here. So tell us about your trophy moment. Well, actually, I've, I've two, but the main one that comes to mind and the story that I shared with you was when I was, um, I think I was 10 or 11 years old and I was playing Pop Warner football. And to that point, I was you know, pretty good in Little League Baseball, really hadn't played that much basketball, but I was, I was pretty good in football. I was actually a, a safety and an end. They didn't have a tight end back then. There was just ends and I played safety and I kicked and punted. I actually was on the field almost every play. And um, not knowing if I was any good or not, but I just loved to play ball, you know. And I won the most valuable player on our team, and our team was really good. And uh, it was at that moment, it was really the first significant trophy, individual trophy I ever got. But it was at that moment that I realized that, you know, maybe I had something special. Maybe I was talented enough to be able to work at something and make something out of myself. So it was that pivotal moment for me getting that trophy that actually gave me the belief that, this is something that you might be able to do. And I've really carried that confidence. You know, I, I played major college basketball at Memphis State. I uh, played against players like Sidney Moncrief and wow. Daryl Griffith. I played football against Lawrence Taylor and Reggie White. I'm not sure too many people can no. say that, you know. And I, I played some college baseball, too. So, you know, whatever whatever the, the impetus of that um, confidence was, I, I believe it was that trophy moment, and that's why – um, and you know, specifically, I, I it was a with. punt passing, if I remember correctly, punt passing kick. Was, you was, won. Well, there were there was two trophies. Two. I won the, won MVP the MVP of our team, but then I did win the punt passing kick uh, competition when I was like the local competition when I was ten years old. Yeah, yeah. I looked like Andy Reid out there. Remember Andy Reid's punt <laughs> passing kick? It looked like he was about thirty years old standing with eight year olds. But <clears throat> so that that's that's pretty good for somebody that's been accomplished. That's yeah. and you remember that, and you still have that trophy. I, I do remember it. I believe I still have the trophy. Um, it's tucked away in, uh, in in a closet somewhere. And then, of course, my other trophy moment is being able to 
show my NFC championship ring with the Eagles. I'm pretty proud of that. We earned two more rings with the Stars, too. So I think I hold the record for being the worst player in pro football history with the most jewelry. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 Whatever works. <laughs> that's that's incredible. Yeah. That is incredible. You've been blessed. I, I have been blessed. I, listen, I, if, there's, if I do have a positive <laughs> attribute, it's that uh, I'm willing to try. I, I'm willing to look foolish if I believe in something. You know, if you if you look back on my history, you know, um, in college I never played high school football, and then I went to play major college football. We're playing Texas A&M, Florida State. You know, old Miss. Big time. This is big time. And my friends are all telling me, "You're going to get killed, man. What are you crazy? You can't do this." And so I just I believe I can do it. And then coming out, coming out of the college, I chose the Eagles. Well, you're not going to make the Eagles. Why don't you try from those lower I said, I just feel like this is the right move for me. And even with the magazine, people are saying, you're crazy to get in the magazine business. People are getting out. I said, I think there's something there. And so if I have an attribute, it's just that I have the courage to follow my convictions. And in those cases, it really paid off. There, there's a lesson there, people, if, you're, if you haven't been listening. It just If you've got a conviction follow it this, despite whatever the follow odds are or don't listen to gut. people listen when you stretch when you and and you're a great example of this actually um when you stretch your your personal growth you make other people uncomfortable because they're not doing what you're doing so they have a tendency to try to hey hold on man you, you can't do that don't listen to that i mean if you feel it in your gut and you think you can do it do it and if you fail so what doesn't matter that's awesome. I didn't think I'd get that, yeah. but that's, that's a great lesson. Um, so I'm going to pivot a little bit yeah. to a first. You've done a lot. I have done a lot. You've yeah. met a lot of people. I have. We're, and prior to this, I asked you, well, what's a first? And you're like, yeah. I don't, I, I've done so much. So yeah. can you answer that question? What's a first that you've never done that you've always well, wanted to do? A, a, you still haven't. A couple things. One, they're probably travel related. You know, you and I were talking before the podcast. Uh, I played uh, football in, in London for the Stars. The USFL had an exhibition game there. It was July of 84. I had just had my first child. I didn't think uh, um, I was going to, I, I mean, I always thought I was going to go back, but we considered getting a URL pass and, and traveling Europe, but I had been away from home for a while. And uh, wanted to get back home. Well, life happens, and I never really had a chance to go back 40 years later. So this year, we went to Europe as uh, my entire family, my four daughters, who are adults now, and, and my wife. And we did Rome, Florence, Tuscany, Paris, uh, Munich, uh, Austria. It was phenomenal. So I think... Uh, and a and, number of them were first for you. Uh, well, every everyone was a first. I had really? never been to Europe before other than the London trip. Really? So, okay. Yeah. So, so that was exciting for me to be able to spend that kind of quality time and see. You know, I can remember I had a couple of uh, catch-your-breath moments. Was One was when I first saw the Statue of David in Florence. And, yep. And that's... That takes your breath away when you see that for the first time. The lighting in that room and the size of that statue. Then I remember we're in Paris. We're turning the corner, and I see the Eiffel Tower out of the taxi window. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, it's something I've always Iconic wanted to see. Iconic and, yeah. Never seen it before. So that was pretty cool for a guy my age to get goosebumps, you know, seeing something like that. I, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. And the fact that we could do that with my four daughters as a family at this stage of the game was, was really pretty cool. You were sharing a story with me about one of your firsts was flying a plane. That's actually been something in the back of my mind that I've always maybe thought I'd like to do. Um, but uh, I haven't done it yet. I'm a little bit claustrophobic and a little bit afraid of heights, but uh, you know, what the heck? I mean, I think I, I'd like to give it one shot. As long as that guy's sitting next, like he was yeah. with you, sitting yeah. next to you, he's got the controls. So uh, we're, we're not in disaster mode. But um, th those are two, two firsts. I, I want to do some more traveling. I, so uh, where, where, so if I well, said to you, where do you want to go? What's, yeah. It's another goosebump moment that you want to experience yeah. somewhere in the world. I, I would think um, that it, as far as Europe is concerned, I'd like to go to uh, Portugal. In Spain, I'd like to, if I go back to Europe, I want to go to Sicily, and I didn't go to Venice. Um, my wife, uh, part of her family is uh, Sicilian, so we'd l probably like to do that. Maybe the Swiss Alps, you know, Austria was a little bit close with that kind of environment, but uh, 
seeing that I, uh, northern Italy and Switzerland, I think would be pretty cool. Um, I'm not one for long plane rides because I'm so uncomfortable. So, you know, going to Australia or um, or the, the Philippines or, or yeah, something like that. I kind of would like to go to Tokyo, but I'd have to get one of those. You know, cabins where you, they, you have pajamas and you, you sleep in a chair or something. That, that would be the only way I could I could stand that flight. But uh, as far as firsts are concerned, I think, yeah, they're mostly related to travel and maybe taking a shot at flying a plane. Well, I, I, I told you about my experience with flying. Oh, yeah. I, you, you can do it. Well, I think you've inspired me to uh, give it a try. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll hook you up. All I'll right. tell you exactly uh, All right, how I did it and who, who you can use to do it. Good and deal. it's It's relatively... I don't want to say easy, but it's it, you can expedite the process. I'll tell Terry to pump up the life insurance for, <laughs> before we go. We Terry, should, I don't want to be we responsible. Should be in shape. <laughs> so you, you you talk about your four daughters. Are they involved in the business? They are. My my one daughter Ashley, my oldest daughter, uh, she's really helps me run the company. She handles all of our events. She goes down to Miami to help coordinate those. And she's intricately involved in uh, all of the events. Keith, you come to our parties. Our, our parties are well attended. Our, our big parties usually have 150 to 300 people. Yep. There are some pretty nice places in the area. Our smaller pop-ups, which we have one tonight, usually about 50 to 75 people. And we do those to try to promote the local business people that support us and our network. So getting people in their door, we happen to have it at a law firm tonight. And, uh, you know, hopefully they'll get some prospective clients out of it. Um, so the events. It's a, and it's a family affair because is, I see your wife there. I is. see your Terry, other daughters. Terry is, uh, really helps us with the events and the planning and the decorations. My one daughter, Alexandra, who happens to be a cancer survivor, by the way, she's a triplet. Uh, she lost part of her hearing uh, with her cancer treatments, but she's very healthy, active, vibrant. She runs our office and helps us with the events. My uh, one daughter, another triplet, Jamie, she runs the website for us. So she puts all the stories and the ads up on the website. And then my other daughter, Taylor, Jamie and Taylor are both OR nurses in the city. Taylor is not active in the business, but she comes down and supports us wherever yeah, she I don't can. think I've ever met Taylor. Yeah, she's, uh, she's, she's great, great. They're all great kids. I, I got Luckily, they take after my wife and look like her, yeah. which they remind you're, you're very fortunate. Which they remind me all the time. <laughs> Dad, I'm glad we look like mom. I'm like, don't sugarcoat it. Tell me what you really feel. <laughs> so, so these first that uh, I'm going to take you back to s some of the travel. So, rank it. Is it Sicily number one? Is it? Uh... Uh, well, you mean as far as my next trip? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I would say. Uh, Sicily and and uh, and Venice would be uh, one or two. You know, it's hard to say not knowing about the places you really don't know where, exactly where you want to go. For example, I was telling you we went to Paris on this trip, and I, I had heard some stories about Paris. They don't really like Americans, and they can be a little snobby. I can tell you that uh, Paris was one of my. If 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 Florence and Tuscany were one, Paris was one A because everything about that city, the culture, the architecture, the food the wine, the, the ambiance, the women are walking around dressed like models. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's an amazing place. And uh, so I really enjoyed that much more than I thought I would. So, you know, who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe my next trip, I'll be surprised again. I'm, I'm not so, sure. So, exactly I just sure. got back from Sicily and Malta. I just uh, mentioned that to you. So I'll, I'll share with you my itinerary. I'll share with you. I, I always put together a Shutterfly book, a photo book of all my travels so you get a sense of what it was but the if do you like history i do so the valley of temples was just an amazing architecture the, the greek architecture of these temples that were preserved um mount etna walking mm -hmm. on mount etna it had it just erupted the week before and it erupted a week after i left that that i thought was fascinating um Malta was just gorgeous. Uh, so it's in Palermo there. I, I had said that I would, if I don't see another cathedral, I'm fine. <laughs> and I've been through a lot of them in, yeah. in traveling, but again, there were so many unbelievable cathedrals, oh, yeah. the open fish market. Everywhere you go in Italy, there's a, a church that's more yeah. beautiful than yeah. the next. I yeah. mean, so that, that is some place that I would recommend, especially right. your wife is from there or. She had her parents. Her parents are from there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. So, <clears throat> what else do you got going on? So, 
Jersey man, what, what do you see in the future for Jersey man and, and Philly man? Um, you know, I just, uh, growing it by cities. Well, people, people ask me that all the time. And you know, what's your, what's your end game? What, you know, what's your exit strategy? I said, listen, I, don't, I really don't have one. That may be poor business planning nah. on my part, but for me, I try to wake up every day. I, I love what I do, and I'm really proud of the brand that we've created. It is amazing, yeah, the brand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I just put my head down and, and try to find people that can benefit from this network we've created. And what happens with that is they'll get some business out of it, and they'll tell other people about it, and that's how our network grows. Yeah. So my focus is on putting, you know, together a, a high-class journalistic magazine with great photos and a lot of great information. But then from a business network side, I'd really try to help as many people as I can and focus on that. And it's, ama- it's the old Zig Ziglar line, you know, the, the more people you help, the, the more they help you and yep. uh, or something to that effect. And, and that's correct. I mean, I, I, I my focus is on trying to help people get something out of what we've created. And I, I've seen you in action. Right. I've seen you actually do that, make introductions and, oh, yeah. and help we others. We love doing that. That's, that's so I'm going to shift game. gears. I know that you're a golfer. Yeah. Okay. I'm a mediocre golfer, but I mean, I am. But a you golfer. enjoy golf. I do enjoy golf. It's the only game I can play. I'm all beat up. It's the only <laughs> game I can play. <laughs> but is there a golf course that you've always wanted to play and haven't? Well, now that's very good. You know, I should have thought of that. Obviously, Augusta would be something that would be a great. To play it to play or it. To, to walk it. it? To play it. To play it. I, I, have, the, I have the saddest master story. My entire life, I wanted to go to Augusta. About five years ago, Me too. my brother wins tickets in the lottery. I stay at my partner's house in Hilton Head. We go to Augusta. We park the car. We walk in the gate, and they signal. No, it's this is a Wednesday, par three tournament. This is a big day. Yeah. We walk in the gate. They sound the horn. Weather, weather delay. You have to get off the course. <laughs> I, I haven't been in the gate for 15 seconds. I said to my brother, I said, I don't care if I get arrested. I'm going to go see, I'm going to go see Amen Corner. I'm going. And he goes, well, I'll follow along. So it's, I'm like a salmon swimming upstream. Everybody's going out. I'm going in. We get to Amen Corner. I see it. I stand there for 15 seconds. And the cops say, hey, you got to go, man. So, so we leave. Now, when you're coming in, it's staggered. So there's not long lines. But when everyone goes out, everyone has to come back in at the same time. So now I'm standing in line for an hour to get back in. They let us come in. I'm not in the, the gates 15 seconds, and it starts to pour. I cannot see my brother who's standing at five feet. It's raining that hard, right? So I said, there's a couple things I want to do. I want to go get a pimento cheese sandwich and a beer, which were like soggy. I couldn't even eat them because it was raining so hard. And I want to, I want to walk the golf course. So not thinking correctly because I thought I had enough time. We started out on one and walked nine. If I had to do it all over again, I would have started at 10 the, yeah, the back and back. walked to 18. But um, so at, when we got done with nine, they said par three tournaments canceled. The day is over. You have to leave the premises. And, and I, I was talking to God on the way home. I'm like, really? I, I waited my whole life to go to the man. This is what you do to me? You couldn't give me two hours of sunshine this freaking day? I mean, come on, man. But I'm, I'm sure I'll go back. So so you I'm, haven't been back. And so you, I have not been back. But and I you've never seen the back nine? I've never, well, just that, the, that the one glimpse corner. Yeah, when yeah. I almost got arrested. But I will tell you this. I know several people that have played it. And there is a way to get on. Now you got to kind of network your way mm-hmm. through some some pretty big wigs. Everybody can get on Pebble Beach. That's another golf course that I'd, I'd like to play. Of course, I, Pine I've Valley is the number one course in the world. I've played there, you know, fifteen times because I have some local contacts. Played there last time actually with Mike Quick, uh, the Eagles receiver, who's a member of Pine Valley now. He he invited me on. So I understand he's a good golfer. He's a very good golfer. Yeah, he, he uh, told me he's a four handicap. He's probably in that area. I know he, the last time I played with him, he shot seventy six, which is pretty good. Did you did you break a hundred on Pine Valley? Did I? Oh yeah, I've played him. I've, I've shot uh, my low, my best score in Pine Valley was eighty one. Oh, so you're not that yeah, bad of a golfer. I said don't, I was mediocre. Don't, don't give us that. I didn't mediocre. Say I was bad. I Shoot me one at Pine Valley. But here's another great Pine Valley story. I played, the last time I played was with Seth Joyner. Mm-hmm. Now, Seth Joyner is. I've a, heard he's a good golfer. He's a big, intense man, is what he yeah. is, okay? So, like, he gets out of the gate, bad. He bogeys one and he double bogeys two. And I thought he was going to start breaking clubs. I mean, that's how. That's how pissed this guy was. I, I, I don't. I don't know. I know him a little bit from alumni, but I said, Seth. I said, just enjoy yourself. You're at Pine Valley. I don't want to hear you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
you know, so he's, he's three over after two holes. You know, he shoots 75 at Pine Valley. I'm like, dude, that's unbelievable. Yeah. You were one over par for the last 16 holes at Pine Valley. And uh, there's an uphill par five. I think it's 16 or 14. I can't remember the number. Straight up the hill, almost 600 yards. He almost, he almost put it on in two. I mean, uh, you know, driver three wood right to the, the corner of the green. So, uh yeah, he can play, yeah, but that's uh, that's that's a pretty special place too. Pine Valley. So, you, so and so the best place that you've played is Pine Valley. I would say the best, and the one, one that you want to play is. I would say Augusta. Augusta. Augusta I would say Augusta slash uh, Pebble Beach would be my my two. Have you ever played over in Scotland Ireland? I've never played golf there. Um, of course, you know, not having been in Europe all that often. Um, some friends of mine they they love it to go, but. You know, I play so much golf here locally, like kind of when I travel or on vacation, I don't, I really don't, I kind of yeah. like to put the clubs away, you know, and yeah. just do all Enjoy stuff. with the family. With my family, yeah. 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 So, it's been awesome. And is there anything else that I missed that I should have asked you that you want to tell the audience? Listen, uh, I owe a debt of gratitude to people like you who saw what we were trying to accomplish here and, and, and got on board with us because it wasn't for people like you that believed in us. This thing never would have happened. So I'm appreciative of you and relationships uh, like you that I have within the business community. And uh, I'm really I'm proud to have established this, this brand. And I look forward to leaving a successful business to my two daughters who are working in it so they can carry on the tradition when I'm, they, they when tell I'm me you don't work in it anymore. Anyway, well, they, they, they do all the work. They, uh, <laughs> it's funny how I'm the only one in the office all the time. This work from home thing is better for the millennials than it is for the, the owners. I can tell you that. But, no, they're, they're all in They're uh, they, they love it. They love what they do. So, yeah. Well, again, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you coming down yeah. here. We're, we're, we're broadcasting live from the pyramid club and thank you again, Ken. Thank you. Great Appreciate to be with you. Take care. Success.